Welcome to episode 277 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak encouragement into the hearts of educators and get you informed and energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking about how you can take the fewer things better approach, even when there's a staff shortage at your school. Visit truthforteachers.com for an easy to read, easy to share version of this podcast episode. Today's episode expands on some topics that I cover in a book called Fewer Things Better, The Courage to Focus on What Matters Most. The Fewer Things Better book is designed to address the overwhelm that comes when educators are pressured into trying to do it all. Just trying to manage your time better or work more efficiently isn't going to fix it. The most important step is getting clarity and figuring out how to use your life to make an impact in ways that really matter. The book will help you strengthen your courage to do fewer things, so what remains can be done even better. You can also participate in the Fewer Things Better project, which is a free mini course. The FTB project will help you implement the ideas in the book and reflect on how you want to be spending your time. Each exercise will give you a clearer understanding of your priorities, so you can develop an actionable plan for what Fewer Things Better looks like in your life. Learn more about the book and get access to the free mini course at fewerthingsbetter.com. Before I begin, I want to say that this episode might get you fired up and maybe even a little angry about working conditions. Feel free to listen if that kind of experience feels helpful, if you want to kind of have an outlet for your range and be able to channel it into something productive, or skip this episode for now if this doesn't feel like the right moment for you to listen to something like that. I have intentionally tried to avoid provoking rage, disillusionment, or talking about depressing topics on this podcast over the past, I'd say probably the last two years or so, because I feel like we've all heard enough bad news at this point. I used to feel like I needed to beat the drum about inequities in schools and schools relying on teachers' unpaid labor, but I feel like those kinds of topics have really been centered in a lot of discourse and a lot of policy discussions in recent years. If I talk about the worst parts of teaching right now in a podcast for teachers, I wouldn't be raising awareness anymore. I wouldn't be letting other people feel that they're not alone. You know you're not alone in this. I would be probably just making you depressed and discouraged by repeating the things that you're hearing everywhere now. I used to feel like a lone voice in the wilderness years ago when I was talking about self-care and work-life balance for teachers, but now those ideas have gone so mainstream, I feel like folks are kind of tired of hearing about it. We've got that message now, and I don't have anything new to add to those conversations, and morale is already so low right now in schools. So what I've been trying to do over the last year or so with the podcast is just staying focused on topics that keep teachers feeling encouraged and focused on the joy in their work instead of outrage at everything that's wrong with the profession and all the injustices and inequalities being faced and everything that's wrong in society. Now, to be clear, I am super grateful for the folks who are still pressing on those topics because it's important work, it's valuable work, it's necessary work. But just for me personally, when I think about my gifts and talents, my areas of expertise, the platform that I have, I felt that the best thing I could offer to you in this moment of history is something more uplifting, something more positive, something that helps you tap back into what's true and real and meaningful and lasting. So I do think this episode will be energizing, but we are going to wade back into the waters of some stuff that's frustrating about the profession. It's necessary to do that sometimes in order to properly address what's going on and create change. So let's do it. Let's talk about staff shortages and substitute shortages. I think school staffing issues have been one of the most difficult lingering effects of the pandemic for us to move past. And unfortunately, we're continuing to see things trend downward. In fact, I think a lot of teachers have used the last few years to really prioritize tasks and cut back on unnecessary obligations. A lot of teachers have been using this time since the pandemic to create better boundaries and streamline their workload. But if you are constantly covering for absent colleagues because there's no subs, or you're not getting a prep or a planning period 
because you have to teach an absent coworkers class or take their students into yours, or you're doing the work of several teachers because there are long-term subs who are untrained. These are folks just filling in the gaps until permanent hires are found. Your awesome productivity systems and your wonderful boundaries are going to break down. And that's a major problem that I've been hearing a lot of teachers talk about over the past two school years. The other issue that I'm hearing about a lot is the guilt that comes from saying no or taking a day off. Some teachers have even been told explicitly that they should not take their sick days unless they absolutely have to because it's such a burden on their colleagues. And this is just wild to me because there's always been guilt for teachers in taking a day off because of, you know, the learning that students will miss out on. There may be behavior issues. You may have accommodations that you do for students with special needs that a sub is just, you know, the student is not going to do well with the sub. Let's put it that way. So there's always been, um, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy. And then you have to do all the sub plans too. So taking a day off has always been hard, but now teachers are being outright told, you know, don't take your days. You know, we don't have any subs. It's unfair to your colleagues. You need to come in, you know, unless you're, you know, in a really, really bad situation. So I want to address that first. Then I'm going to share three principles of doing fewer things better that will help you unpack some of the harmful school cultural norms so that we can consciously challenge the status quo. And then finally, I'm going to suggest three practical solutions so that you can figure out what fewer things better looks like when there is a staff shortage. So it's my personal and professional opinion that all school staff and faculty are entitled to take all of their allotted days off. And that's true whether the district has coverage for them or not. And here's my reasoning for this opinion. There is zero flexibility in the schedule for educators. Folks who work in schools have no option to switch shifts with a colleague or choose their vacation time like a lot of other industries do. It's almost impossible to have a personal life that never overlaps with the school calendar. Your friends and family aren't planning their weddings and their special events around your school calendar, right? And not everything in life can be planned in advance to accommodate a work schedule that has no flexibility, especially if you have kids or other caretaking responsibilities in which you frequently encounter last minute emergencies. So for these reasons, and quite a few more, I actually take an even more extreme stance on this and say that folks shouldn't even have to be sick to use their allotted days off if they don't have any personal day allowance. So some districts give you sick days and personal days. Some just give sick. I think that people should be able to use their days for whatever they need them for. It's just too much of a slippery slope to unilaterally determine what qualifies for a sick day. What about a mental health day? What about a preventative day in which resting and having a break from work will keep you from getting sick physically or mentally and having to take more days later? I feel like educators are already micromanaged and treated like children rather than professionals in so many ways. Let's just allow them to use their allotted days off without having to explain what they needed those days for, and certainly without making them feel guilty because there is a sub shortage. When I was in the classroom, I always felt free to utilize my sick days however I wanted, because every administrator I worked for understood that making their teachers justify taking their allotted time off was a bad look. And these are not all incredible administrators. I've had wonderful principals and I have had terrible principals. Even the worst ones that I have had did not harass their teachers about sick days. Teachers using sick leave for personal purposes was not this huge issue in most schools until there became a huge sub shortage. Suddenly now it's selfish to use your allotted days for anything other than a dire illness. If you're not dying, you better come in. So let's be clear, this is a structural and systemic problem, and the buck is getting passed to individuals. So my opinion is, take your days off when you need them and don't feel guilty about it. It's just that easy, right? Well, of course not. Otherwise, this episode wouldn't be needed. So let's look at some of the ways that educators feel pressured to come in sick to not use time off, to not say no to extracurriculars, to cover for their colleagues without extra pay, and other hazards of teaching in a time of sub and staff shortages. 
I think we've all seen teachers who set boundaries and prioritize their own needs and have experienced negative consequences for it. We've seen folks who have been blackballed for being really outspoken about what they will and won't do. Um, And we've seen folks be judged for it, either by administrators or by other teachers. There is a cultural norm in K-12 education that teaching is supposed to be a calling. If you are called to do this for kids, then why would you want to do less? You should be giving 110% at all times. And if you don't want to dedicate all of your time and energy to the job, then you should just be in a different field. If you're not willing to pitch in whenever and wherever you're needed, why are you even in the profession? Now, sometimes these things are said explicitly. Sometimes it's just sort of implied. And you can just tell from the judgmental looks and the judgmental reactions that you get when you try to set boundaries. And it really just baffles me because we know what the teacher attrition rates are like. We see educators burning out left and right because the goalpost keeps getting moved. You give 110% on something and then you're told, okay, great, now I need you to give 120% and also give 120% to these four other things. I think it became clear during the early days of the pandemic, during emergency remote learning, that there will never be a limit on what's asked of teachers. It will never be enough, and it will never be fully appreciated by all stakeholders. So many teachers commented during that time that the more they showed themselves capable of doing, the more they were asked to do. With each new pivot they made, often overnight with no training or support, they were hailed as superheroes. And that lasted, what, a couple of weeks? Max. And then the broader push societally became either well, that wasn't enough. Our students suffered because you were barely barely doing anything during remote learning. You're just sitting at home doing nothing. Or, well, since you've shown how flexible and resilient you are, you really rose to the challenge. You did a fantastic job. Now we know you're capable of being pushed to the limit for extended periods of time. And now we can make you do the work of multiple teachers since we can't seem to hire more. This is a lose-lose situation for educators. And when you can't win the game, you have to change the rules. This is what folks in power have been doing since the beginning of time. And it's the solution here too. We have to tackle both the societal norms and norms within school culture that make it very hard to say no and that keep pushing more obligations onto educators. We have to be aware of the implicit expectations, the things that are not usually stated outright which are baked into the school culture and are easily internalized. So let's unpack some of these norms that influence school culture and examine them through the lens of doing fewer things better. The first fewer things better principle is that your school is your community, not your family. Generally, there is a sense of family or community that is intentionally established in schools. And because of this, many teachers are guilted into picking up the slack for absent coworkers and unfilled teaching positions because they're told we're a family here and family looks out for each other. I think it's important to note that feeling like a family at work is not necessarily a bad thing. And the phrase is not always used to manipulate. It can be used in a positive way. And a lot of teachers enjoy it. They like hearing it. Like, You know, if a family member um, is ill or maybe you've had a baby, hearing we're a family lets you know that you are loved and supported like family. So we just need to pay attention to when that's the case and when it's not. What is the intent of the school family trope? What is the impact of the school family trope? Is it being said to make you feel loved and supported like a family member? Or is it being used to exploit you for unpaid labor? After all, you don't get paid to help your family. A family dynamic also increases the pressure to go along with the status quo because family members generally aren't meant to question tradition. They pitch in, they do whatever it takes, they accept whatever is because it's for their family. And here's the thing. You're irreplaceable to your family. Whether it's your real family or your chosen family, you are irreplaceable to them. But your school family can hire someone else to take your place within a week. So watch for when the school family analogy is being used just to manipulate you into doing all kinds of unpaid extra duties. Because here's the kicker. 
The school family phrase makes it seem like we're being pressured into going above and beyond for the kids, when in reality, we're just doing it for the institution of school. The institution has failed to attract and retain educators, and your unpaid labor is propping up their failure. And quick side note here, this is part of why we need to fully fund our schools. There are a growing number of powerful individuals and groups who want to see public schools underfunded. They want to see public schools failing so they can divert the money to private and charter schools, which they can personally profit from. Now, I don't want to get off on a tangent about school choice because I do think choice is important and non-public schools can be wonderful. But my point is that as long as our schools don't have the funds and resources necessary to meet all of their students' needs, the pressure on educators to work for free will continue. We need fully funded schools and we need schools that can attract and retain educators. So question the school family analogy when you hear it. Just bring your awareness to the implications behind it. And when you're choosing which words to use yourself, consider finding a term that is a bit less loaded. I really like the phrase school community. In a community, you have a responsibility to work together, be cohesive, support each other, but you don't have all that baggage and implied guilt trip of letting your family down. The community also has an obligation back to you as well. The second fewer things better principle is this. You can be there for the kids and for the paycheck. This is another reason that teachers often get sucked into covering other duties during a staff and substitute shortage because of this motivation and this pressure to do it for the kids. How can you look in those sweet baby's eyes and tell them they won't have a coach for their sport this year? How can you let those precious ones down? It's the kids who are going to suffer if you say no. Do it for the kids no matter what was termed the woman's honor code by Seth Nichols. He is a former teacher who wrote an epic blog post years ago called Why Teachers Are Walking Out. He observed the teachers in his school, which, like most schools, was close to 80% women, and concluded that the tacit expectations that all teachers feel are actually grounded in gendered expectations for women. He observed how teachers in his school would do whatever it took to prove they were good caretakers, good nurturers, that they loved their students and would do anything for them. It's the woman's honor code. Do it for the kids, no matter the cost. And since teaching is a woman-dominated field, that pressure is felt by everyone. Yes, as educators, we are there for the kids. But the problem is that teachers' pure intentions and genuine desire to make a difference have been exploited. The powers that be know that if the school doesn't provide what kids need to thrive, we as educators will pick up the slack. We will figure out a way to get kids what they need. We will work dozens of unpaid hours every week. We will make our materials from scratch and spend money from our own paychecks if it's going to benefit kids. And we've been conditioned to believe that this is just part of the job. So we'll find ourselves neglecting our health, our relationships, our home, even our own children, because the school family needs us. And we need to do, quote, whatever it takes for students. And for many educators, there's no clear alternative. No teacher wants to feel like they're shortchanging kids. That's an accusation that cuts to the bone for educators. We won't dare try to simplify or ask for what we need or insist that our needs be met because that might give others the impression that we're here for something other than the kids. So the message that I'm really passionate about normalizing in the education space is this idea that you can be there for the kids and the paycheck. This is not a volunteer position where you're supposed to be there for purely altruistic reasons, only there to help. You can enjoy making a difference and also enjoy paying your bills. These two outcomes are not mutually exclusive. The root of it for me is this. I believe teachers should have the opportunity to be fully actualized human beings with career aspirations and hobbies and hopes and dreams apart from only sewing into the lives of other people's children. We cannot agree to do whatever it takes at any cost, because the cost is our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. The cost is to everyone who's in relationship with us. 
And ultimately, the students suffer too, because when their teachers are so overwhelmed and overworked that they're not able to show up as the best version of themselves each day, we get to the point we're at now, in which many folks ultimately decide the sacrifice is just not sustainable. So we have to replace do it for the kids no matter the cost with find a sustainable way to be a great teacher and have a great personal life. We cannot sacrifice all of our time and energy for our job. Our job is just one way that we're making an impact on the world. It's just one thing that we do in our lives. So I think it's important to realize that when you're saying no or setting boundaries, yes, the kids might lose out sometimes, but they also lose if you burn yourself out and you quit or if you're too exhausted to do your best work. And you are not solely responsible for carrying the load. It can't all be on you to be everything for every student. You have to make tough choices about your limits and where your time and energy is best spent. The last school norm that makes it hard to do fewer things better during staff and sub shortages is that of being a team player. So this final fewer things better principle is that being a team player should not routinely require unpaid labor. And I think this is the hardest one for most teachers because they know that if they don't do something that has to be done, one of their coworkers will likely have to step up. And that means burdening their friends and acquaintances with extra work. And who wants to do that? This can lead to the crabs in a barrel phenomenon in which we don't want to see anyone else rise up out of a bad situation and we pull one another back down. It creates a culture in which we're wary of teachers who stand up for themselves and don't allow themselves to be exploited, because if another teacher sets boundaries, we might have to pick up their slack. The folks who say no can make us uncomfortable because they remind us of how very precarious this whole institution of school really is, and how even a handful of people saying no can create a domino effect we're afraid that we're going to be left to pick up the pieces. And when we're responding to each other from a place of fear, we're not going to make wise, healthy decisions. When we're angry that a coworker isn't agreeing to do unpaid labor, our frustration is understandable, but misplaced. You see, like the school family trope, be a team player is a phrase used almost always in the case of unpaid labor. Lesson planning and grading papers are your job, which you are paid to do. You're not being a team player when you enter your own data in the computer. You're not being a team player when you assess your students or or prepare materials for them. But when you're asked to do other people's jobs, their lesson plans, their class coverage, their paperwork, or things that aren't part of the core of your job, this team player manipulation comes in. And the truth is that all extra work that's outside your standard teaching duties should be handled by someone who is trained and paid to do it. Your school deserves aides to handle supervision duties during non-instructional time. You shouldn't be pressured to do lunch and recess and cafeteria and bus and hallway duty. Because when are those things happening? During your planning or prep time. They're happening when you're supposed to be focused on your real job which is planning and preparing lessons and assessing the work your students have done and being responsive to their needs. Instead, you're mopping the cafeteria floor because there's no one else to do it, and you want to be seen as a team player. So all the stuff that really moves the needle for your kids, that really impacts their learning, either doesn't get done or gets done on your own time for free in the evenings and weekends. This norm has evolved into a survival mechanism for schools because they're so underfunded and understaffed. The only way for schools to function with the level of resources they have, and I include public, charter, and private in this, because these norms affect all schools, the only way they can still function is if people buy into the mentality that they are part of a school family, they need to do whatever it takes for kids, and they have to be a team player. So I think we have to be careful to examine our role in this racket. That's not to say you should never pitch in and help out or that you should never do something that is not in your job description. We're going to talk in a moment about healthier ways to create change. But awareness is really the most important step because when we can clearly see what's happening, we can be cognizant of the ways we reinforce these beliefs to one another. So let's talk about three ways from Fewer Things Better to push back against these norms. 
the first fewer things better solution is this. Channel frustration and anger into problem solving and speak up with solutions. I think a lot of teachers are afraid to speak up because they don't want to be seen as angry or complainers. And as I mentioned, we've seen colleagues face consequences for being, quote, negative. But there are effective and ineffective ways to speak up. You can certainly say, this is not right. I'm not going to stand for that. I'm going to go to the union if you try to make me. I was in the classroom for 11 years, and I think I used that type of approach maybe a total of three times, maybe. It is very risky, and it could have profound implications on your career trajectory. This is not the go-to strategy that you want to use every time that you're asked to cover for a colleague or do other unpaid labor, because frankly, in most schools, you're going to be asked to do something kind of unreasonable every day. So that kind of thing is just not an everyday strategy. Be careful not to default to defiance. Be careful not to make passive-aggressive remarks and then comply anyway. A lot of times those kind of behaviors are intended to be pushed back, but they just don't work well. They're sort of a last resort for people who feel powerless and feel like they don't have many good tools in their toolbox. So we want to give you tools so that you're not resorting to defiance and passive aggressiveness. One of the best approaches is speaking up with solutions. If you go to your administrator in a professional, solution-oriented way, What could be seen as a complaint could actually turn you into one of the most valuable members of the faculty. Most of your colleagues will just talk about the problem behind the principal's back. You, on the other hand, are approaching the principal directly with actual solutions. You're not just saying, this is unacceptable, fix it. You're saying, we both know the situation is not ideal. I've been trying to brainstorm some alternative approaches here. Can I share some of them with you? You're either going to leave a discussion like that with getting something that's closer to what you want, or you're going to better understand the limitations and the extenuating circumstances. Either way, you're going to have more information about how to create the change you want. You're opening the door for new possibilities instead of just assuming that you can't do anything about it and things will always be terrible. So you want to have some ideas in mind when you approach your administrator because they're busy, they're overwhelmed too, and they're not mind readers. They don't know what you need the way that you do. So figure out what you would like to have happen and suggest ways to make it happen, rather than placing the burden on someone higher up to find a solution. The solutions they have may not work better for you. Why not shape and influence the change yourself? Take the initiative to problem solve. That's going to make you look good, not like a complainer. So when we're talking about staff shortages, I have seen teachers rally together and insist on being paid an hourly rate to give up their prep periods to cover for colleagues. I've seen teachers initiate a vote about which committees and extracurriculars to temporarily suspend until staff shortages improve. I've seen teachers ask to have certain duties removed from their job responsibilities so they can focus on the core aspects of their work that support students. These are all fewer things better. Let's focus on the things that really make a difference, do them well, and let go of the rest. So here's some examples of things that you might say. I can cover for my absent coworker for a couple of days while they're out, but since I won't have a prep period, that means I won't have time to enter all the required grades and other data into the system. Could we sideline that for this week? Or which of my responsibilities is least important to you right now? And can I take that off my plate this month to focus on covering for my colleagues? Could we postpone all non-essential meetings and delay committee work for the next two weeks to reinstate some planning time? Sure, I can help support the substitute teacher next door today. These are the tasks I was planning to get done in my prep time before and after school. Which of these responsibilities would you prefer that I set aside in order to work with a substitute? This additional duty is going to cut into the time I use for grading and assessment. I know it's important to maintain timely feedback on student work, and I want to prioritize that. So what time during my contractual work hours can we set aside for me to do this student assessment? Realistically, I won't have time to do both of these new things that you're requesting this week, and I don't want to let you down. Can you tell me which task is more important to you so I can be sure it gets done first and then tackle the other task next week? When you come in with this mindset and you're speaking up, you're coming with solutions instead of just complaints. You're coming with possible alternatives. You're coming in with suggestions. 
and you're having an honest conversation about what can and can't be done with the limited time available. A second way to stay on the fewer things better path, even when there's staff shortages, is to actively be in solidarity with other teachers' work. I think in every school, there are a handful of teachers who feel like they're the ones doing all the heavy lifting. They're the ones all the other teachers go to when they're upset, and they want this handful of outspoken folks to speak up for them. We see the same thing happening on social media, right? It's the same people talking about the tough and controversial topics in education, and other people will DM them privately and say, thanks for speaking up. And what I hear from those teachers who've been doing the heavy lifting is that they're tired of being the ones with their necks on the chopping block all the time. What they really want is for other teachers to stand with them. So maybe you don't want to or can't lead the change on a particular issue, but if another educator is speaking up on it, show them support. If the discussion's happening online, share it and comment supportively on it. If it's happening in a staff meeting, nod, affirm, Do things visibly to show that you're on their side. Raise your hand and add an additional point to let your colleagues know you're with that person rather than just thanking them afterward for speaking up. I encourage every teacher to take a stand personally on at least one particular issue. Imagine if every teacher in your school did that. Imagine if every person took one injustice, one inequity, one exploitation seriously enough to say, I'm going to find solutions for this. I'm going to help our school do better. Imagine if only half your faculty did that. I mean, even that's powerful. I know it's unrealistic to expect that of others when we're not even speaking up ourselves the way we need to. But if we could each focus on our part, if we could each pick one thing, one thing in which we take the lead, school would be different. We can find our aspect of change that we're willing to work toward and support others and theirs. Then, instead of having all these overwhelming, unsolvable problems that feel impossible to overcome, we know this issue is my thing, and I'm fighting for that. That issue is your thing, and I can count on you to advocate for that. We sign each other's petitions. We back each other up in team meetings. We affirm one another's school-wide emails, and so on. That is creating a culture of teacher agency and empowerment. That is shifting the norms in your school where teachers don't just sit back and let all the decisions be made for them. That's taking an active role in a very balanced and healthy way to create better working and learning conditions. The final way to keep doing fewer things better despite staff shortages is to practice quiet subversion. I first talked about this back in 2015 when I wrote my book, Unshakable, 20 Ways to Enjoy Teaching Every Day, No Matter What. But I revisited that concept and went way more in depth with it in Fewer Things Better because it seems to become more important with each passing year. Teachers are being expected to do an increasing number of things that aren't good for kids and that are completely burning the teachers out. And as I shared, you can't face every problem head on because there's too many of them. You do have to pick your battles, but you don't have to just suck it up when it comes to all the other issues. I think... Some teachers are rule followers. They want to do things right. They want to be seen as caring and committed and dedicated. So not doing something they've been told to do just isn't something that even comes to their mind. And for other teachers, there's been a lot of fear placed in their hearts that they will be pink slipped or they'll be blackballed if they don't do what they're told. Their job will be in jeopardy. But here's the thing. All the best teachers I know are quietly subverting the system. They smile and nod and then they close the door and do what's best for kids. They document stuff on paper like they're supposed to, and then that teachable moment comes up, and they run with it whenever they can. And I just want that to be said here publicly because obviously someone who is employed by a school district is going to be reluctant to say that explicitly. And that's why you think it's not happening. That's why when you look at these teachers that you admire and you wonder, how are they doing all of that awesome stuff? How are they making all of this work? They've either found a school that is a good fit for their values and they have a bit more freedom, which is often true for some of the more visible educators online, or in the majority of cases, they're being quietly subversive. And by the way, both of those options are available to every person listening to this. A myth that I try really hard to debunk both in the book and in the 40-hour teacher workweek program is this disempowering mode that we tend to fall into where it's like, I don't have a choice 
or I can never be happy in this field. You do have a choice. You are a trained professional who brings a tremendous amount of wisdom and insight and life experience to the profession. You can choose to make some sacrifices to find a school where you can thrive. That's something that never stops amazing me in my work as an instructional coach. School culture is very different from one building to the next, even within the same zip code. All teaching jobs are not the same. And if your school is not valuing and respecting and supporting you, you have options. You deserve to exercise your agency because this is your career. This is your life. And if you choose to stay where you're at, you don't have to just do everything you're told if what you're being told is not best for teachers or kids. The most effective teachers I know are not blindly following all the orders and obeying all the rules. They're quietly subverting the system. If you want to delve more into this, you can check out either the paperback, ebook, or audiobook version of Fewer Things Better, The Courage to Focus on What Matters Most. There's also a free mini course that goes with the book as well, so you can figure out how to put the principles into action. And if you really want to do a deep dive into streamlining every aspect of your work, from grading to lesson planning to parent communication and so on, that's where the 40-hour teacher workweek program comes in. It is professional development on productivity, which has been used by tens of thousands of teachers since 2015. It will help you maximize your contractual hours and stop working endlessly on nights and weekends. We will be opening the doors for early bird access in June. So go to 40htw.com to learn more. So 40htw.com to learn more if you're interested. Your takeaway truth for the week ahead is this. The staff in sub shortage adds more work for the folks who remain. That's true without a doubt. But this is a time in which fewer things better really shines as a guiding principle. Doing more is not sustainable. We don't have the staff to do everything we used to do. So what really makes an impact for kids and how can we focus on that? How can we do fewer things so that we can do what remains even better. Have a great week. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.